So as Tom said, today's topic is accessibility. How accessible is it? Let's look at a proactive approach. So just as a little bit of background for me, I have both state university and FCS experience. I am currently um, working as a full-time staff member here at IRSC and an adjunct faculty member. I'm kind of a jack of all trades as I have filled a number of roles here at IRSC. I have been a virtual campus technician where I was troubleshooting uh, computers and helping faculty with training. I was a course developer. I was a course developer and trainer. I was an instructional designer for a number of years and most recently have moved into the role of director. I have over 15 years of experience in online education. I did my entire master's program online. Um, I have been working here as an adjunct and a designer in online courses as well. So I kind of have seen it from all of the different perspectives. And I also have face-to-face um, -face hybrid and online teaching experience. What is digital accessibility and why is it important? Some digital accessibility practices, what IRSC's approach has been, the Ally Accessibility Tool, and your questions. So the US Department of Education, as of 2019, reports that 19% of undergraduates have a diagnosed disability. With the ever evolving world of technology, staying abreast of the latest ideas, tools, products, processes, trends is paramount in higher education. As technology grows and it transforms, we must be sure that we're adapting so we can ensure that our students have a seamless experience. So what is digital accessibility? Digital accessibility focus on learners who have particular needs related to sensory, physical, and or cognitive impairments. So it's kind of a very broad range that, um, you know, umbrellas over a lot of different things. And why is it important? So online accessibility is important because research suggests that 66% of students who may qualify for disability related accommodations don't disclose that they have a disability. So that's why it's paramount that we approach these situations from a proactive and not a reactive approach. We want our courses to go into um, the live sections and things like that ready to go. We don't want students to have to ask, we want to present it to them. They may not wanna disclose because they're embarrassed or they don't actually know that they can get special accommodations. So if we start switching our mindset from reactive to proactive, we're going to be supporting our students just that much better. Section 508, I'm sure, you know, when it comes to accessibility and when it comes to um, inclusive learning and UDL, everybody's heard about Section 508. They've heard about ADA. There's a lot of like legalese that you may hear of, um, but the big thing in 1998, Section 508 was added to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This mandates digital accessibility, meaning that federal agencies, contractors, and fund recipients must make their electronic and information technology accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, most recently, there was an update in 2018, which is why there's been such a big focus and switch to accessibility, especially in higher education. So digital accessibility in higher ed. As I mentioned, higher education often employs a reactive approach to accessibility, necessitating unscheduled and unexpected content updates when the needs arise. Um, having accessible and usable content empowers our students with the resources that they need to succeed um, academically, in their personal lives, in the workforce. If time is taken from the start, you know, creating documents from scratch that are accessible, um, faculty and staff can spend more time with their students, grading, teaching, um, going through professional development instead of having to kind of flip that switch and get into high gear to make things accessible when they're asked for. Um, so our mindset here at IRSC has been, let's make things accessible from the very start and see what we can do from there. And just some basic digital accessibility practices as we get started, there are a number of different technology content and types that I am sure everybody is familiar with. We're instructional designers, we're content developers. So when you think about the content that you're creating, try and um, think about, okay, how can I make this accessible? 
So lecture captures, Echo 360, uh, Camtasia, a lot of um, like Screencast-O-Matic and things like that. When you're creating those, make sure you're creating closed captions with them or provide script transcripts for those lecture recordings. Um, this makes sure that all of our students can access it, um, whether they have a disability that causes, you know, with hearing or sight or anything like that. If we go into it with captions or transcripts, we're covering our bases there. And the same is true for instructional videos. Um, something that we normally do here, you know, we use Echo 360. So we have captioning available through Echo. Um, but if we are running short on resources, which I know is quite common, you know, throughout the college system right now, um, we can use YouTube. YouTube will automatically generate captions for videos that are uploaded. You just have to go back through them and check for accuracy. And there are a number of tools available as well. Image-based content. Think about infographics, pictures, diagrams. Try and include the text equivalents for visual media, such as alt text or narrative text. Um, you want to be descriptive. You don't need to say this is an image of. Just purely write in your alt text what you see in that image. And then presentations and documents. Use legible font, sufficient contrast. Um, make sure you use heading styles. Headings are something that I think um, a lot of us don't really think about. We always see them in that ribbon at the top of the Word um, window. And we're like, okay, it says heading or it says body, but we need to start being cognizant of those headings because students that are using screen readers um, actually rely on those to navigate and tab through the document. So I like to get in the habit of looking at the headings and adding heading one, heading two, and things like that in the Word documents so I can make sure they are accessible. So document checklist. As I just mentioned, um, looking at headings and things like that. This is just a quick, um, you know, kind of self-check when you're creating a Word document. Um, you could be saving it to a PDF. You could be using it as a form. So can your text be highlighted, copied, and pasted? Um, one of the best ways to tell if a document is going down the right track of being accessible is if you can do that. I'm sure some of you have seen PowerPoint presentations or PDFs where you try and highlight the text, but it's actually just an image or a picture that was scanned. So that's what we've got to try to get away from um, because you, who, there's not gonna be anybody that wants to write alt text for an entire textbook. So we need to make sure that we're properly making our documents accessible, whether that's from scratch when we're creating them or using an accessibility checker that is um, on board like through Adobe or through Microsoft. So were headings used properly? This image on the right shows the headings panel in Microsoft Word. So you can see different options here, heading one, normal, um, subtitles. You'll wanna make sure when you're creating your documents that, are, that you're using um, headings in the proper order. So don't go from heading one to heading three because you like the size. Make sure you're going in chronological heading one, heading two, heading three, and you can always change the format there if you'd like to as well make sure that you use sufficient color contrast. And I have a link that I will share in chat um, real quickly with everyone that has a number of resources for you, including a color contrast checker. You wanna make sure that not only is there proper contrast, like don't put you know white text on a yellow background, but that the text that you're using is actually going to be legible by all students. So you may have a student in your class that suffers from color blindness. So you'll need to make sure that you're using the appropriate colors. So within that resource list that I posted in chat with the bit.ly link, there is a link to a color contrast checker that you can use for your courses. Another uh, thing to look at is if your images contain alt text. If you include a graphic or an image that has information that the student needs to understand, you'll have to make sure that you use alt text. If it's just decorative, there are options in Adobe and in Word and all of those programs where you can actually right click and hit edit alt text and set as decorative. And then did you double check um, an online accessibility checker or built-in? So here on the bottom, is the bar that I see in Microsoft Word. And if you go to the review tab, you can actually click check accessibility and it will walk you through a number of things such as alt text, color contrast, tables, um, and things like that. As I mentioned, there is a lot of 
stuff when it comes to accessibility. There's a lot of hands-on and in-depth. So I'm gonna try and answer as many questions that you all submitted as possible. So moving on to a PowerPoint checklist. So when you get started, one of the easiest ways to ensure accessibility is to use a template that was built in uh, with PowerPoint. You don't have to, you can create them from scratch, um, but there are a few things to keep in mind. Is there sufficient color contrast between the text and the background? I know sometimes it's really appealing to have a really flashy PowerPoint presentation, but sometimes when it comes to accessibility, less is more. Um, I know when I was in college, I liked to use things that had a ton of animations and a lot of graphics and you know colors that I liked, but as I've learned more and more about accessibility, more often than not, I'm using a plain white background with just a couple of colors and some images. It does look clean, um, but it's also accessible. Did you verify the order of text in the outline panel? So when you're creating slides in PowerPoint, you may be adding text boxes, you may be adding images. You'll wanna make sure that in the outline panel, the items are in the order you wish for them to be read. So if you are moving some things around on your slide, make sure that you update them in the outline panel too, so that your student is getting the information in the proper order. Do your images include alt text? Similar to Word, you'll wanna make sure that you include alt text for all of your images. And did you double check with the built-in accessibility tracker? So the image on the right actually shows what the PowerPoint accessibility tracker looks like. It will tell you if there are any errors such as missing alt text or if a slide is missing a title. It will tell you if any of your text is hard to read, if you need to check the reading order. It will also give you tips and suggested alt text. You can click any of those little carrots and they will actually expand to show you exactly which slide and item needs to be updated. And you can also get information from there as well. When you click on the item at the very bottom, it will ask, it will ask you if you would like more information or if you would like to know how to update that item. And believe it or not, Excel is also accessible and has its own built-in accessibility checker. So, most of us may think of Excel as, you know, purely data driven, but some people use it to present information and present data. You can actually include images in Excel and those like the other pro products will need alt text. So make sure you add descriptions there too. Um, the biggest thing with Excel is making sure that you identify your headings and your columns. Um, this can be done through the properties menu in Excel. And you'll also want to make sure that if you are using hyperlinks, that you use meaningful text. Don't just say click here, uh, because when the student is reading that, they're not going to know what click here is. Um, so what I like to do is I would say, you know, visit this link for more information on FLVC. Um, and then I would use the hyperlink there. And then avoid merged cells. I know we have you know, oftentimes if we're creating a title or subheadings or things like that, our gut, you know, instinct is to just merge the cells and center the information. But that makes it really difficult for students with a screen reader to navigate the data. So my suggestion is don't merge those cells, um, but you can actually just make the, um, you know, the borders invisible if that's what you're trying to accomplish. And then did you use the built-in accessibility tracker? Um, in most of the Microsoft products at the very bottom, you'll see where it says accessibility, like right here. And you can actually click on it to learn more information about that document and about the accessibility of that document. So video and audio checklist. I'm not gonna go into detail about different programs because then we would be here all day and all week. Um, but the most important things are to make sure that all of your video items include captions or transcripts. Sometimes you may have a faculty member that's utilizing a video from an external source that doesn't have uh, captions. You can always try and reach out to the person that's hosting the video to see if they do have a transcript. And the same for audio files. So think about podcasts. Um, you'll wanna make sure that your podcasts have transcripts available as well. And when it comes to quality assurance, accessibility is going to be found in all of the different quality assurance rubrics. So here at IRSC, we use Quality Matters. So we're looking at General Standard 8 when we're reviewing our courses, which says that course design reflects a commitment to accessibility and usability for all learners. I know quality assurance is a biggie in online education, um, especially when it comes to accreditation. Uh, you'll have to prove that, you know, 
your online courses are going through some sort of quality assurance process, whether it's, um, you know, a national rubric like Quality Matters, or if it's something homegrown, um, like UF has their own. Um, but these are just some examples of some of the more popular rubrics that can be used and how they reference accessibility. So Anthology, previously Blackboard's exemplary course program, has a number of substandards that look at accessibility and course design. The OLC Quality Scorecard has course development standards 8 and 9 that look at accessibility as well as standard 8. And then Quality Online Teaching and Learning Rubric, um, Section 8 for them as well, is the Accessibility and Universal Design. Um, it addresses the course's adherence to accessibility and universal design principles. So no matter where you look, um, they're looking at accessibility. So let's go into some brief tips for online um, design and development when it comes to accessibility. So first and foremost, clear, consistent layouts and organization of themes. Think about what you're trying to get across and that's how you should be organizing your data. Structure your headings and use built-in designs and layouts. Um, so for example, here, my um, title would be used as heading one. Um, the biggest place that I usually see hiccups when it comes to headings is when you transfer a document from Word to a PDF. So you can do save as PDF or export to PDF from Word or from Google or even from SharePoint. And then when I open those documents in Adobe, if I didn't have my headings correct in Word, chances are I've skipped some when I open the panel in Adobe. And I'll see that the title is heading one, but then the next subheading is heading three. So I have to go into the tags panel within Adobe and edit those headings. So that way, when my students use screen readers, they're going through the proper information in the proper order. Use descriptive wording for hyperlink text. For example, do it knowledge base rather than click here. Uh, you want your student to know exactly what that hyperlink is and where it's going. Minimize the use of PDFs, especially when they're presented as an image. So we don't want to incorporate a bunch of scans. Um, there are ways that you can make images accessible. You have to run them through the Adobe Accessibility Tracker um, and it will try and scan the document at OCR. If you use Ally, there's also um, an alternative text format there. Sometimes you can export the document and it will become more accessible. Um, but I always try and find the source so I can edit it there and use that moving forward. And then provide concise alternative text descriptions of content presented within images. So you wanna make sure you describe what's being seen, um, but don't use, like I said, don't say this is an image of, just dis define what is in the image and what you want your student to get out of it. Use large, bold fonts um, on uncluttered pages with plain backgrounds. Like I said, I'm a big proponent of the white backgrounds and the you know black or dark colored texts. I think it's easy to read, it looks clean, it's streamlined. Um, but a lot of times any of the, the templates that you see within the office products uh, will work and be accessible. Use color combinations that are high contrast and can be read by those that are colorblind. Make sure all content and navigation is accessible using the keyboard alone. Um, some of our students may not be able to use a mouse functionally. So we wanna make sure that navigation is easy. Caption or transcribe video and audio content. And then you'll want, to, when you go into your classes and when you're going into content uh, creation and development, assume that students have a wide variety and a wide range of tech skills. So you can provide options um, for all students, whether they need to gain the skills needed for class participation, or they may already be, um, you know, fluent with some of the technology you're using. Um, we have a ton of new um, freshmen here at IRSC this year, and we're trying to train, um, you know, our faculty and staff that we can't make the assumption that everybody is at the same level that we are as far as, you know, when it comes to technology and skills like that. So if you enter into your thought process when you're designing content, and you're designing documents with that in mind, um, it'll be a little bit easier for your students too. So the next part of the presentation is just gonna be talking about IRSC and some of our processes and background and what we've done to improve accessibility on campus here. 
So as of fall 2021, we had 10,022 fully online students. Of course, that was at the end of the pandemic. So I think a lot of us were seeing those online numbers, but our online numbers continue to trend. Our online team right now is one director, three instructional designers, and one course developer. So we are very small. <laughs> we used to have um, a much larger department, but we've kind of been uh, broken up into some different departments on campus. So there's just five of us right now. We are managing over 300 master courses. Uh, we're a Quality Matter subscriber. So every single one of the courses that we design and develop through IRSC Online is internally reviewed through QM. And most of those are sent out for external review as well. And Blackboard is our LMS. So here's our approach to accessibility. So back in January, 2018, um, the section 508 wording uh, and legislation was revised. So that kind of kickstarted this idea of, okay, we really need to get the ball rolling on accessibility. Let's see what we can do at, from an institutional standpoint. So that spring we created the IR IRSC accessibility work group. Um, through our global campus, IRSC Online, we had a work group that kind of had a bunch of subcommittees. So we decided to use the accessibility work group as one of those subcommittees. The subcommittee did research. Uh, they did focus groups on campus. Uh, we talked to faculty, we talked to students, we talked to other staff, and we made a number of recommendations, which I will go over on the next slide. Then we formed a specific accessibility team. So that team was a smaller group of our accessibility work group um, that was tasked with creating presentations, providing training. It was um, one of our former employees here at IRC, Lucy Mello, spearheaded all of this. Um, and she worked with student accessibility services to really get this off the ground. And so that spring or the following spring, we implemented Blackboard Ally or Ally, which is not just available on Blackboard. It's um, available on a number of other LMS as well. And that summer we started offering professional development. We were introducing our faculty and staff to Ally and the accessibility tool and how it could be used and how they could improve their classes. We were providing specific hands-on training for how to make documents, PDFs, PowerPoints, Excel, all of that more accessible. And that fall, after providing these trainings, we created a number of templates that we shared institution-wide. Um, we created accessible syllabus templates and schedule of activities, which are documents that are found in every class. And we made these available institution-wide. Um, we're in the process of switching right now to simple syllabus. So we're going to be getting away from the paper syllabi, but there are still you know, schedule of activities and a number of other documents that we'll be seeing in every single class. Spring 2022, our overall accessibility score was 74.3%. Um, which is a great increase from where we started, but we would like to see that um, continue to rise. I know we're never going to be perfect, but we can always strive to be better. And in the future, we're going to expand this accessibility initiative. Uh, right now, my team and I are in the process of creating um, a homegrown accessibility training that would lead to a certification that faculty, staff, um, anyone could go through, learn and do hands-on activities and tasks about making items more accessible, learning about the background and how they can improve their courses. Um, so we're in the process of doing some data gathering for that now and hope to have it up and running within the next year or so. The initial recommendations were to make ADA compliant templates for the syllabus and the schedule of activities and make those readily available to our faculty, which we did, to design and host workshops on ADA compliance, accessibility, UDL, and things like that, and then to create an ADA component for institutional professional development. Uh, previously, we did have a virtual campus instructor training course, and we were working to incorporate that into that training. Um, we've kind of switched to using AQ most recently, um, so there is some accessibility in there, but we're hoping to expand our offerings within our Institute of Academic Excellence so we continue to offer these webinars, these hands-on trainings, and these boot camps to get our faculty more comfortable. So Ally or Blackboard Ally or however you want to refer to it um, is an online tool that is integrated directly into the LMS. So we added our LTI and we turned it on. And that's when we started to get all of our data. Um, it identifies documents and files that have accessibility issues. Um, as you can see from the screenshot in the very top, it will just provide a little gauge next to every single item. 
um, that tells you, okay, is it good? Is it bad? Does it need improvement? You can click on that to get more information. And then this little button here with the A with the down arrow is actually alternative formats. So that's where students can click to get, you know, um, tagged PDFs or they can get electronic braille and things like that. So that's their alternative means of access. And it also provides institution-wide reporting, which is fantastic, um, especially when you're trying to, you know, pitch how you can improve accessibility and what you need to do on campus. So the accessibility score will have four different colors, red, orange, light green, or dark green. Um, basically it shows you the percent of accessibility for a document um, and how much help you need to improve it. So perfect, high, medium, and low. So this is an example of the instructor feedback window. So if you saw one of those dials that was red or orange and you're like, man, I really want to know what this means and what can I do to improve it? You can click on that button and this is the screen that you would see. So on the right hand side, it would tell you uh, the percentage of accessibility, um, what items need to be improved. But there's a ton of information here. You can ask what it means. You can click the button that says, how do I add descriptions and how do I fix it? Um, and on the left-hand side, it will actually show you all of the instances in the document that have that error. Um, you can actually upload a file once you fix it using the upload um, window here, and it will automatically refresh and give you a new score and upgrade or upload that document in place of the previous document. So this is super helpful when it comes to making documents accessible. You don't have, there's not a lot of guessing because it tells you what you need to improve. Um, so I always try and encourage my designers um, to take a look at these documents as they upload them and see, okay, what can I fix? You know, is it something I can do? Do I need to send it back to the faculty member? They, Ally actually has um, overall institution reporting as well. So it will tell you if you run an Ally institution report, how many of each error there are. Um, it breaks them down into severe, major and minor. It will tell you what the issue is um, and how you can fix it. And if you click on these uh, descriptions, you can actually drill down to the course, you can drill down to the section and you can actually, it'll tell you how many documents of each you need to fix. Um, so our kind of plan was to, okay, let's focus on the severe ones first and then move down into the major and the minor. This is another example of reporting that I pulled from Ally. Um, you can download reports from specific time periods if you're looking for like one semester or a year long. Um, this actually told me that within a month and a half, we had 17,283 students download um, alternative formats. Uh, it goes into detail about the most common. So we can see Beeline, Braille, EPUBs, HTML, um, OCR PDFs, tagged PDFs. Um, and audio files. So students are really using those alternative formats. So Ally is actually helping them to be more successful because they can digest these items in a way that works best for them. On the other hand, here is our instructor feedback window. So that's that first window that I showed you where you can update the content and the items um, to improve the accessibility score. We actually had 402 items launched, but only 91 updated. Um, so when I was going into my endowed teaching chair award application before um, you know, jumping into creating this training, this number really spoke to me because I'm like, there was only a 22% conversion rate. There are a number of reasons it could be, you know, there's, there wasn't time, they just wanted to see what the update was, or they're just not comfortable or not sure how to make things accessible. So that's where our kind of thought of, okay, let's be, let's provide the education they need to succeed, our faculty and our staff, how can we equip them to be better prepared? And that's kind of what gave the impetus to this training. And so as we're wrapping up, I wanna make sure that we have um, plenty of time for questions because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of them. Um, one of my favorite quotes about accessibility comes from Deborah Ra, who's the founder of Tech Access. Uh, and she said, accessibility allows us to tap into everyone's potential. Um, and that really resonated with me um, as I started to jump into this kind of rabbit hole that is accessibility and figure out what I can do to make things better. 
here's my contact information. Um, if anybody is interested in reaching out, has specific questions, please feel free to email me or call me. I'm planning on setting up a few um, like kind of like coffee hours here at my institution to kind of talk about accessibility. So if that's something you're interested in and you're kind of local, uh, please let me know. And then just some questions. Uh, this picture is from when I went skydiving on my birthday, which I never thought I would do, but here we are. <laughs> so if you have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat or turn on your microphones and I'd be happy to answer them. Mm -hmm.